All right, we're going to take off a mouthful. And we'll kind of go back and chew it up a little bit and see what the Lord has for us. So, John's Gospel, chapter 2, and verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. And now there were six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of Jews, of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good until now. This is the beginning, note this, of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, and his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not say, stay there many days. And now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple, those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. And then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show to us since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them. And they believed, note this, the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There's a lot there. There have been scholars upon scholars for the course of thousands of years since this scripture has been written that have taught on John chapter 2 on both of these portions taught on the wedding at Cana, turning water into wine. I mean, even those who don't know Christ and those who don't really aren't familiar with the Bible, you can talk to most people, you know, outside of, you know, church, so to speak, and they'll they'll tell you that they know about the story of water into wine. In fact, there are lots of people who make jokes about that. Lots of people outside the church know of the story when Christ did this miraculous work of turning water into wine. They also know Thank you to pop culture and to movies and to whatever else the, uh, the movie industry has made to be the story of Christ. You've got to be really careful with this stuff. And I know I'm sure many of you have probably watched, you know, and I say this a lot, many of you have probably watched like the History Channel and, uh, you know, the story of the Bible and the History Channel. It's, it's fine, entertaining stuff, but it's really not a, a, an accurate biblical account. You get that. It's not a very accurate kind of Bible um, historicity, so to speak. It's, it's entertainment, but the History Channel has got some real flaws in what it teaches, especially when it comes to man history. But what we see here 
is the Lord then cleansing the temple. The story or the, the account of the Lord cleansing the temple. And this is the first cleansing. He does this again at the end of his life. He does this really twice. The first time he does it, it's, it's noteworthy that he doesn't just go in there and just tell everybody to get out. He walks into the temple, and we're going to get into this in a minute. He walks into the temple, and he sees the court of the Gentiles turned into a bazaar, turned into a carnival. And really worse than that, it's turned into this place that is absolutely, there's no, there's no worship of God going on there at all. And so what he does is he goes into the temple, takes a look around, and he leaves, goes away, takes the time to go make a whip, takes the time. Now listen, my, I, want, I want to kind of boil this down for you. Takes the time, and then takes his disciples away to show them that he's making a whip. And then what does he do? He goes back. Goes back into the temple, and he cleanses the temple. And I'm going to get into this in a little bit. I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to show you that this is just as miraculous as anything else that he's ever done, believe it or not. It's not really noted as a sign. You know, what we think is that the Lord went in there all kind of haywire. We, we, we've watched the movies. We've seen kind of, you know, the, uh, what was that, that one depiction with William Defoe? He goes in there and just loses his mind as Jesus Christ. He goes in there as, as the Lord and just kind of loses, takes his whip, and he starts swinging the whip around like he's a lunatic, just kind of driving everybody out, right? I don't think that's what he did at all. I think that what he did was very specific. But when you take a look and you read the story, it wasn't like all of a sudden there was this mass chaos of people just rushing out of the temple. They all, all the Bible says is that they just left. Everybody just left. Everybody just leaves. And then he's standing there in the midst of the court of the Gentiles. And he rebukes those who are making this a den of thieves. I'm not going to add too much to this. And then after that, he finishes this chapter off by saying he didn't commit himself to man because he knows what's in man. The first story we see is the wedding in Cana. Now, it's worth noting that this is the Lord's kind of stepping out onto the stage of his ministry now. He's stepping out into the stage of his earthly ministry. And it's worth noting that what he chooses and when he chooses to do this is at a wedding. Listen to me. If there is any one thing, if there is anything that the Lord really values, any relationship that the Lord values as far as our kind of person-to-person -person relationship, if there's any one relationship that the Lord values over any other relationship that we have, it is the husband and wife covenant. The husband and wife covenant is by far more important, biblically speaking, than any other relationship with any other person that you'll ever have. The husband and wife covenant. And it's worth noting that this is how he steps out onto the scene. This is what the Lord uses to step onto the scene of his earthly ministry. He comes to a wedding, and the first thing he does at this wedding is he makes water into wine. And listen, it doesn't really seem like, it's, you know, we would kind of take a look at like the whole walking on water thing as kind of a bigger deal, right? I mean, if you think about it, like any kind of trickster can turn water into wine, even in the days that we're living in right now. You know, any kind of like, you know, if you go to like, you know, any major illusionist or some sort of magic show, there are people that can do certain things. I mean, it's kind of amazing to watch. But what the Lord does here is he takes a moment to step out onto the scene and he turns water. Not just one cup of water, vats of water into wine. On the third day, we don't know what the third day is. It's probably a Wednesday. Most scholars agree that this is more than likely a Wednesday. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, she's clearly somebody who's serving there, which means she was not just an invited guest, but she's probably somebody that knows his family very well. She knew enough to go up to Christ and say, listen, they have no more wine. So this is clearly, she's clearly somebody in this wedding. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And that's really worth noting because clearly the Lord was familiar with this family too. The Lord was probably pretty familiar. This is his region. Remember, this is, he's a Galilean. This is his region. People probably knew of the Lord. I mean, certainly, they'd probably already heard the stories and the rumors, so to speak, at the time, quote-unquote, that 
Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, is the Messiah. Well, who said so? John the Baptist. I mean, his word was pretty good. I mean, John the Baptist was, no, was noted as a prophet. I mean, he was legit. If John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God, the one sent to take away the sins of the world, if the word of John the Baptist was accurate and true and he was a prophet and everyone, everyone took him as that, then he's the one saying that this is the Messiah. In fact, he told his own disciples. He told John and he told Andrew, go follow him. He must increase. I am going to decrease. He's the Messiah. I am not he swore to the Pharisees and to the other elders from, uh, from Judea that he was not the Messiah. He was not that prophet. He was not Elijah. He wasn't looking for any glory. He was pointing to Christ. Christ is the Messiah. He's on the scene. Go follow him. And the people in Cana heard that. So he's invited. And it's worth noting, by the way, I wish more people invited Jesus to their wedding. I really do. I wish, you know, in the, in the day and the age, and I'm not going to go off on a political tirade. I really try not to. In the day and the age that we're living in right now, marriage means nothing. Even in the church, it's, it's sad. You know, a man and a woman coming together and swearing an oath before God. You know, that's no small thing. You stand before God and you stand before assembled witnesses at every wedding I've ever performed. I say that. I say you're standing before God, not me. <laughs> Lord knows. Not me. But you're standing before the Almighty God and you're taking an oath in front of all of these assembled witnesses. And you know what that oath says? That oath says that you will never, ever, ever, ever leave this person for any reason. There are, and then everyone goes, well, what about the ba-ba-ba-ba-ba? What about, pastor? What about, what if they're really abusive? What if they're emotionally abusive? What if they're physically abusive? And usually they're talking about the guy when it comes to that. What if they're, all, what if they're a mental case, and I didn't know that? Well, then you shouldn't have gotten married. What if I didn't know? What if I didn't know what they were? What if I didn't know that they had all sorts of debt? What if I didn't know that they were horrible with money? What if I didn't know that they couldn't hold down a job? What if I didn't know? Listen, nowhere in the Bible, just, just so we're clear on this, nowhere in the Bible does it say that you need to stay in a relationship where you become a punching bag, ladies. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you need to stay in a relationship or stay together with somebody that's using you as their own personal punching bag, physically speaking. You can put your husband out. Put him out. Want to slap a restraining order on him? Go ahead. I've actually helped ladies do that. If he's abusing you, if there's some sort of you know, physical abuse going on in the house, put him out. No doubt about it. And I say this with the utmost sensitivity and sincerity. According to the word of God. Please hear me on this. Because I don't, I really don't excuse any behavior no man should ever be doing that. And I don't excuse any of that behavior. Really don't. The concession for divorce, biblically, the only concession for divorce, biblically, and I'm hard-pressed to say this, but I will stand on the word of God and you can argue with me if you want to, is adultery. I'm going to leave that there. I do not condone abuse. I do not condone physical abuse. If you are in an abusive situation and you need to put that dude out, you put him out and you keep him out for as long as you need to. Marital divorce. The concession for it is adultery. I take this very seriously because the Lord here is stepping out into his earthly ministry at a wedding. And we see this interaction with the Lord and his mother. Do you know what the Bible says in Genesis at the very first wedding in history? For this reason, a man shall do what? Leave his mother and his father and cleave 
to his wife. Genesis is really clear on this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. In this moment, I think that this is what we're seeing here a little bit. We're seeing the Lord leaving his mom. Not because he doesn't love her. Not because he doesn't honor her as his mother. But what we see him doing is we see him stepping into the role that he was born to play. In fact, we see him stepping to the role that he was actually sent to do before the foundation of the world. You know, the Bible says that he was the lamb slain before when? The foundation of the world. He's coming out at a wedding. I think it's a beautiful picture. Because we're called the bride of Christ. He's coming out and stepping out into his earthly ministry at a wedding. What a wonderful day. What a wonderful way to step out into ministry at a wedding. At a wonderful wedding, at the day of celebration. And listen, just so we're clear, Jewish weddings weren't just a kind of one day on a Sunday or a Saturday that we have. One day on a Saturday, you just kind of hope to invite as many rich people as you can because you're looking to kind of pad that envelope. A wedding feast for the Jews was a week and it was a jam life was hard life was really really difficult listen they didn't have any of the luxuries that we have today we're so spoiled in the day and the age that we live in right now they didn't have any of the luxuries back then that we have today none so if there was a party if somebody was getting married somebody in your town was getting married they had a gym they threw that thing out for a week they got together and they partied they ate they drank they celebrated this was the joining together of two lives forever and everybody was involved the whole entire village all the family all the friends everybody that they knew come together and they celebrate this wedding union and it's also worth noting that you know what do you know who paid for it all it wasn't the bride's parents it was the bridegroom the bridegroom paid for the whole kit and caboodle. And you know what they did for a year prior to the wedding? One year, the guy, they would meet. The man would go and he would sit down with the parents of whichever lovely young lady he had his eyes set on. The parents would meet, they would get together, and they would discuss the potential joining of these two young folks. He would lay out his intentions. I want to marry your daughter. Sometimes there was business arrangements with this. I want to marry your daughter. She's pretty. She's really cute. I think I'm not so bad. Maybe we can make something happen. What do you think? The father of the bride would stand back of the potential bride, and say, no. You need to show me that you're going to be able to take care of my daughter. You got one year to do it. For the betrothal year, that man would go build a house, usually on the side of his parents' house. And then he would save up enough money to show his parents or her parents, rather, that he would be able to take care of that girl forever. Because the marriage contract was signed in the beginning of the year, not even at the wedding day. The contract for marriage was signed. It was legal, it was binding, and that was it. For the rest of your life, that was going to be your husband or your wife until you what? Died. Until you died. God takes marriage very, very seriously. Very seriously. You put your name right down. They got licenses now for it. You put your name down on the contract. No matter how difficult this gets, till death do you part. Nowadays, we don't see any of that. It's worth noting that in my own home, if you want to know how seriously I take this, I have two daughters. If I ever, ever, if a young man ever comes into my house, and he wants to date one of my daughters, I'll probably punch him in the face. <laughs> no one's going to come into my house telling me that they're dating my daughter. Not without talking to me first. We live in, and again, politically speaking, well, that's very patriarchal. It's her body, it's her life. She should be able to do what she wants to do with it. Whatever. 
I don't care what our society says. If somebody decides he wants to date my daughter without talking to me first, I'm going to punch him in the face. You can think what you want about that. They're not taking my daughter. He's, that's, that's my daughter, I'm sorry, but she's more valuable to me than anything else. We live in a society where, where the cars that we have parked in our garages are more valuable than our children. I'll let my daughter go out and just kind of figure it out. Figure it out because I don't want to impose my life onto her. I don't want to make those decisions for her. She's an adult. She's going to grow up to be her own person. I want her to make her own decisions. We do this with church too. We do it with church. You know, I don't want to impose church on my kids. I just want them to grow up and kind of make their own decisions about church and about religion. You want them to make their own decisions? You want to make up their own mind regarding the most important thing in their life, which is eternal life. You want them to make up their own mind on that? You want them to just learn from what the world teaches them? Because the world is going to teach them that they don't need Jesus, they don't need church, they certainly don't need the Bible. That's what the world is going to teach them. You want them to make up their own mind regarding that kind of stuff? You want them to make up their own mind as to who they're going to marry. Listen, do you know that in the culture that we live in right now, if heaven forbid, one of your children gets pregnant at the age of 13, one of your daughters gets pregnant at the age of 13, you as a parent forfeit all your rights. (laughs) She doesn't have to tell you anything ever again regarding her body, her health, anything. What she does, she's on her own. They can actually get a lawyer and file an injunction against you as their parent. So no, no. I'm not going to let my daughter make up her mind and figure it out when it comes to relationships. No. I'm going to train up my child in the way she should go. And when she gets old, she will not depart from it. That's what I'm going to do. There are mistakes being made in our culture. I've made some. Maybe you have too. But just because we've made mistakes doesn't mean that the word of God doesn't stand. It stands. And when it comes to marriage, when it comes to marriage, as long as whatever my children does or what they do for work doesn't dishonor the Lord, I don't care. And neither does the Lord what they do for work. We live in a culture where we're so concerned. Everybody's so proud of children, of our adult children, if they go to college, get a degree, graduate with a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, an associate's degree. They graduate, they get these great jobs, they got wonderful lives, and they're making six figures a year. And parents are just proud of that. And that's something to be proud of. But yet no parent is really proud or as proud when they find out that their adult child is marrying someone really, really great. And when they do, if they marry someone, if your children marry somebody who's so wonderful, so great, all of a sudden they realize that that person that they thought was so great winds up to be a real tool and really treats your child and treats your daughter wrong and they divorce. We sit back and we wonder what we really, what was important to them. What do we make important in their lives? We think about that. We think about, is what they do for work more important than who they marry? Not according to God. Who you marry and who our children marry is more important to the Lord than what they do for work. You follow me? This is hard to hear. But according to the word of God, and there's nothing, listen, please don't leave here by saying, you know, Pastor Jonah doesn't like kids going to college. That's not the case. College education, as long as you make sure that you have to unteach them some things that they learn in college is fine. But I'm going to tell you something. I am way more concerned with who my kids marry than what kind of education they receive. Way more. The Lord comes here and says, and we haven't even gotten through, all right, we still haven't even gotten through the first three verses. Okay, (laughs) all right. 
And when they ran out of wine, look at this in verse 3. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Now listen, she goes to Christ. Mary goes to the Lord. Why? Because that's who she's been going to. Maybe she went to, now listen, there's lots of things that teach through this. There's lots of commentators, there's lots of pastors who've taught to this. Maybe she went to the Lord because she wanted him to do some sort of miracle. Or maybe she just went to him because that's who she's been going to since Joseph potentially died. He's the oldest sibling in the house. And listen, by the way, it's worth noting that every single time she went to Christ with a problem, he knew exactly how to fix it. Every single time throughout her life. She would go to Christ and say, I don't know how to fix this door. He fixed it. You guys know what it's like having a real, listen, ladies, whoever, you guys know what it's like to have a real handyman around the house? Somebody who really knows how to do some stuff. You go to them with an issue, they just know how to fix it. Do you ever talk to somebody who's just got all the answers? I have. You talk to somebody, I, I don't know what to do. What, do you, what would you do? Well, what we should do is blah, 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 blah. Really good problem solvers. She had access to God for her, his entire life. No better problem solver than the Lord. And she went to him. She went to him when he was a teenager. She went to him when he was a young adult. She went to him when he was in his mid to late 20s. She went to him. She would say, what do you want to do about here, Joshua? Because that was his name. What do you want to do here? What should we do here? Joseph's dead. What do we do? What do we do? She went to the one who fixes problems. As her son. But then his answer here is, is really... Very interesting. They have no wine. She has a problem. She does the right thing. She goes to the Lord, which is what we should all do. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. This is not woman in the sense that we would, in our American culture, convey this. This this word does not mean the disrespectful tone that we would sometimes uh, put on this. Woman? That's not what he's saying. It's the equivalent of, ma'am, what should I do here? This isn't why I've come. He's separating himself now. He's starting the work to be joined together with his bride. He has to separate himself now from the woman who's had the predominant authority in his life. You read Luke's gospel when he was about 12, 13 years old, Mary loses the Messiah, <laughs> lost him. A couple days before she even knew it. She has to go back to Jerusalem to find him. And when she finds him, I mean, can you just imagine, imagine that? I mean, listen, I lose a kid for like two seconds. You know, I'm not to say that I lose my children a lot, but every once in a while, I just don't know where they go. They kind of have legs of their own. They just kind of wander around. And every once in a while, you look around a couple minutes, and they're like, well, where is so-and-so? Where'd they go? And you got two, three of them, and now all of a sudden, you got to keep an eye on lots more of them, and you just don't know where they go. they got legs, and you start freaking out a little bit. All right, where, where'd they go? They're gone. Three days. A couple days. She doesn't know where her firstborn is. <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's the Messiah, the king of the entire universe is gone. She has to go back to Jerusalem. She finds him. When she finds him, she finds him in the temple, and he's asking questions. He's sitting down with the Jews and the religious leaders of the time, and he's just asking questions. And they were astounded at some of the things that he was asking. And all of a sudden, she comes back, and she, you know, you can kind of put the, you can kind of put this picture in your mind and think about. You can just kind of you look at, you know, how this is going to go down. You think about how this breaks down. And where were you? I was worried sick about you. You can you, listen. This is, we're parents. We know how this goes. Where were you? What were you doing? I can't believe you're here. I mean, we've been looking for you for days. I've been losing sleep. Well, what's going on? And what does he say? Didn't you know? Didn't you know that I would be about who? My father's business. But then at that point, the 12-year-old Messiah, it says that he placed himself again under her authority, and Mary keeps all of these things in her heart. At this point now, He reminds her. He just takes a very brief minute to remind her, I'm going about my father's business now. I love you, but I need to separate myself from you now. And I need to be joined together with my bride. 
woman. What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Worth noting that these are the last words of Mary recorded in the Bible. It's kind of, this is really something that kind of goes against the grain of most Catholic theology. Whatever he says to you, do it. Worth noting that that is really, literally, what (laughs) she still says. Whatever the Lord says to you, do it. Whatever the Lord says in his word to you to do, do that thing. And that's it. We don't hear from Mary again. I mean, we hear her story. We see her in other places. But we don't hear her talk again for the rest of the scripture. Whatever he says, do it. Now there were, there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with what? With water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted, now I want you to note this, not the wine. He says he tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from. But Look at this. The servants who had drawn the water, they knew. And the master of the feast called the bridegroom. Why? Why did he call the bridegroom? Because if he ran out of wine, it's his fault. And that was a huge, that would be a smear across the face. The ultimate embarrassment. If you ran out of wine, and why? Because this is what people drank. People drank wine. They couldn't just drink water. There was all sorts of bacteria in the water. It's not like, you know, you go and you sit down at a wedding feast today. You go into a big hall. They got a little round table set up, all a bunch of chairs that are too close to each other. Nobody can really get comfortable with those things. And then all of a sudden, what do they do? They come out with big vats of water, and they give everybody water. Purified, fluoridated. It's great. You drink down the water, put a couple of lemons in it. You don't got to go pay for drinks anywhere. You just drink in the water, and it's fine. But back in the day, they didn't have that. They didn't have any purification for water. So what do they do? They would take a little bit of water and they would mix it together with a little bit of wine. Why? Because wine is antibacterial. It would kill the bacteria in the water. So if you wanted to quench your thirst, you would have to drink a little bit of water mixed together with a little bit of red wine if you wanted your thirst quenched. If you wanted to get pickled, you drank wine. If you wanted to get good and stiff, you drank wine. That's what you did. You had to drink a ton of it. Lots of it. What he says here is this. Fill those water pots with water. The water was meant to be used for purification. That's what the water was there for. It was a ceremonial water. It wasn't there for people to drink. This was ceremonial water. He says, fill these water pots to the brim. And many of you know, you've probably heard that, that once he filled it up to the brim, as soon as they dipped in the ladle to draw the water out, it probably overflowed and spilled out all over the place. He teaches, very biblical. It doesn't say anything about that here, but it teaches. What we do see is what the result was. The result was they took it and they gave it to the master of the feast and he drank it and said, this was the best. And he goes and grabs the bridegroom, and he's blown away. Because what could have been a catastrophe for him, what could have been a catastrophe for him and his family and his reputation, this was supposed to be somebody that was ready to take care of this bride that he was getting married to. And if he didn't have any wine left over for the feast, the feast was going to go for a good seven days. If you didn't have any more wine left over for the feast, I mean, it's already, I mean, what? First, second, third day. He's into it. You run out of wine now. I mean, the parents are going to be blown. The parents of the bride are going to be blown away. We made a mistake, loser. Can't believe you're marrying this scumbag. That's what they would think. And that's just our modern day vernacular. But that's what parents would think. You're marrying this guy. He can't even bring wine and enough wine to the feast to feed everybody. And I'm going to commit now my daughter into this guy's hand? Horrible. I made a mistake. But the Lord never wanting to embarrass anybody. He says, okay. This miraculous work. 
There are eight signs in John's gospel. This is the first one. John calls them signs. There are other miracles that he does, but there are eight of them. One is turning water into wine. The other one is the ruler's son, the, the ruler of the synagogue's son being healed and raised. The third one is going to be the land man at the pool of Beth Bethesda. And the fourth one is going to be the feeding of the 5,000. The fifth one is going to be walking on water. The sixth is going to be opening up the eyes of the blind in chapter, in chapter uh, 9. The seventh is going to be the, the raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. That's going to be a great one. And then, of course, the eighth is going to be himself raising and rising from the dead. Signs, John calls them. He's doing a new work. He's on the scene and he's doing a new work. He gives them new wine. And listen, by the way, it's worth noting that this is not wine that you and I are familiar with. It was real wine, by the way. It's worth noting that. I don't drink. I don't know if you do. You drink a glass of wine every once in a while with dinner. Whatever, that's between you and the Lord. I don't drink. It was real. It was legitimate wine, though. It was real. There's a lot of people, some scholars say, it wasn't real wine. It was kind of like fermented grape juice and da, da da No, it wasn't. It was wine. It was real wine. That's what he was drinking. It was real wine. But at the end of the day, what he was trying to do is trying to show that he was doing a new work here. He's stepping on the scene and he's doing something new. And he's doing something better. Because the world will always do what the master of the feast said. The master of this feast said that usually at most other weddings, people put out the good stuff, and then when everybody's well drunk, everybody's had enough, they bring out the real rat stuff later. When everybody's had themselves good enough to drink, and everyone's feeling good and riding high, and everybody's celebrating, then they bring out the junk to let everybody else get, you know, <laughs> celebratory on that. But not here. Jesus saves the best for last. With the Lord, it's always the best comes later. Listen, I love my walk with the Lord. I hope you do too. I love seeing the Lord work in so many lives. I love watching the way that the Lord just maneuvers in not just my life, but in the lives of others. I love the blessings that we receive in this age. I love knowing that the Lord is able to come through financially, emotionally, spiritually. I love watching the Lord work in miraculous ways in the lives of so many. People who have been praying for kids have children now. People who have been praying for healing, see, seeing them and watching them be healed. And maybe not fully, maybe to the point where they're just still able to serve and to walk and to move and they realize the grace of the Lord and the blessing on their lives and just watching that happen. Watching people cross over from this life into eternal life when they come to salvation. And watching people's lives just be blessed over and abundantly above anything that we could ask or think. Watching that happen is amazing to me. But you know what's great when I read the Bible? When I get into the Word? it reminds me that we ain't seen nothing yet. You haven't seen anything yet. One day you're going to stand before the Lord of glory and see him face to face. One day we're going to walk on streets paved with gold. One day we're going to see the new Jerusalem coming out of the sky. Listen, think about what we believe. One day all the things written down in the Bible are faith is going to become sight, so to speak. We ain't seen nothing yet. We come together here, we lift our voices, we raise our arms in praise. Where do we get to heaven? Where do we sing the songs in heaven? Everybody will be on key. Everybody will be clapping in rhythm. It'll be great. We ain't seen nothing yet. He goes on. Verse 10, he said to him, Every man in the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. But you kept the good wine until now. And this, the beginning of signs, Jesus did, look at this, in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory. And I want you guys to note this. And his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he, his mother, and his brothers, and his disciples. And they did not stay there many days. 
the very first miracle that the Lord performs in his earthly ministry to show that he's the Messiah is the sign of a new life, new wine. Putting away the old, and by the way, making something out of nothing. You guys realize that this wine was special in this regard. How's wine made? Most of you probably know. Most of you probably, and even, I'm, I'm still kind of in between that generational thing where I remember watching old reruns of Lucille Ball and watching her kind of stomp around the grapes and slipping over it. You know, I'm still kind of old enough where I, I still remember watching those old reruns on, you know, rerun TV when I was a kid. You guys know how it's made. You put it in a press, you press it, you squeeze the juice out, and then you press it again, and you squeeze it out, and you press it again, you squeeze it out, and then you put it into these big giant vats, these big barrels. And what do you do? You let them sit there and age and ferment. And you let the taste actually become, kind of get, gets put in be, you know, through some sort of chemical process from the barrel and from the age and from bacteria. It all kind of comes together in this beautiful drink. You get a chance to suck a little bit back, and some of it tastes great. They got all sorts of wine testers. They swirl it around. They breathe it in. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole subculture of people that are really into wine. I mean, and some of it's really cool. I mean, I, I understand it. I mean, people got to be into something, I guess. None of that took place here. None of the cursed ground fermentation of wine took place here. What do I mean by that? To make wine... You have to take cursed grapes from a cursed ground stomped on by cursed people to ferment a cursed drink. This wine was made in heaven. This wine was special. This was wine that was made in heaven. Made specifically by God. Can you imagine what this tasted like? You know, for those who are free to drink wine, I say amen, go right ahead. For those who aren't, I say amen, make sure you don't. I don't. And, and the reason I don't has got nothing to do with me being an alcoholic or anything like that. It's just that I don't because I just, it's not, it's not good for me to do. You guys who give to this church, you guys don't want me going to spend the money that you give to this church on wine and beer and anything else. I'm not going to go spend that money that you guys put into the offering box on that kind of stuff. I'm just not going to do that. When I will is when he says he will. Because what he said was really simple. I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until. Until. Until when? Until the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's when. And when he says it, when Jesus drinks from the wine, or the, drinks from the fruit of the vine, then I will too. <laughs> when he says it's okay, go ahead and drink from the fruit of the vine. When I'm in heaven in glory with him, I'm going to say, hallelujah. Double up. When he says it's okay, then I say, okay, that's what I'll do it. And none of this really has anything to do with drinking or whether you do or don't drink. It's the Lord stepping out into ministry at a wedding and declaring that he's here to do a new work. He's here to do a purifying work. He's here to make something out of the old into something new and better. He's here to separate himself for the work of the ministry. And he's actually now doing exactly what God called him to do. And aren't you glad that he took this time to lay out this one sign for us? Over the course of the next years, he will be laying down his life for the cause of his bride, ultimately to culminate in the breaking of his body and the spilling of his blood. Amen.